Okay, so this, um, this session is entitled ATVC Rating the Contenders. Um, it ended up being something different than what the name suggested due to uh, lack of ability to get participants. Um, always a frustrating thing. So we, we started, um, this presentation was originally produced for the streaming forum, which was back in March, and I asked a bunch of companies if they wanted to participate, and for various reasons, uh, pretty much most of them said no. Um, and they, you know, they have legitimate reasons, bad timing or, you know, whatever. So don't take any negative connotations from this. Um, but, you know, this is kind of what we hoped to do, and we ended up with two ATBC codecs, the main concept codec, and they were wonderful to participate with us, and the, uh, the X265 codec, which, of course, is publicly available. So those are the two ATBC codecs that we looked at. And to provide perspective, I included an analysis of X.264 as kind of the baseline. That's what most people use for H.264, uh, H which is the primary codec most people are using today anyway. And um, VP9, because everybody is usually interested in how VP9 compares to HEBC. And then later on, uh, at NEB, I don't know how many people learned this, but uh, Bitmovement, who I believe is here at the show, um, streamed AV1 live at NEB. So I asked them if they would encode the test clips for my comparison, and they, they agreed to do that. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, how, HEBC, how the two HEBC codecs compare um, to each other, how they compare to, to X.264, how they compare to VP9, and how they compare to AV1. Um, the focus is totally BOD, so it's not live. Um, I tried to compare these two codecs um, on the basis of time. We'll get into that in, in, a, in, a, in a bit, but that's what this means. I looked at three resolutions, 720p, 1080p, and 4K, and I looked at five profiles within each resolution. We'll see what that means in a moment. And I tested with four video files, um, primarily these three. And I looked at this one for one set of tests that I'll explain when I get there. So when, when I talk about, you know, here's the three, um, the three resolutions we tested at. And we tested at five data rates at each resolution. So we not only wanted to see what it looked like at one data rate, we wanted to see what the progression looked like over the various data rates that we were looking at. Um, the parameters that I use, you know, you can, you can love them or hate them, but these are the ones that I used. Um, we used the main profile, not main 10. Um, we had a keyframe interval of two seconds, three B frames, and six reference frames. And, you know, you, we just wanted to pick one set of parameters we'd apply everywhere, and those are the ones that we chose. Um, the data rates were all encoded to within 5% of the target. So every time we produced a file, the first thing we did was, you know, this is a table in Google Sheets. This is the theoretical target. You put the number in here. If it's not within 5%, you get a red box. So every file that we produce, we then assess the, uh, the data rate to make sure we were within the, um, the targets. For I, everything was done via the command line. Um, did not use any application programs in this particular exam. You can, you know, hopefully this executes the parameters that we talked about before. Um, significantly, this command string was created by multi-coreware. So this was not something I kind of put together. This was something that they looked at and said, okay, these are the parameters we would use for this file. Why did I do that? Because they know their codec better than I do. And we didn't want to get exotic, crazy. We wanted to use general purpose parameters, but I didn't want to I didn't want them to come back to me after the test and say, hey, Jan, you should have done this. So I said, well, tell me what to use, and I'll use it. And they actually produced all of these, all of these parameters for me. And pretty much every vendor did that. And, and we'll go over that in a, you know, as each one. So significantly here, we, we enabled tuning for PSNR and SSIM. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Right now. <laughs> so the... Um, so when, when you think about tuning, what you don't want is the codec doing things so they look better, you know, so they score better. And, you know, so initially I resisted tuning. And then I got schooled by um, the people at Multicoreware and also a lot of the people who developed the X.264 codec. And they said, look, you know, we're not tuning to get better scores. We're turning off quality enhancements that degrade objective quality measurements. 
So whether you believe this or not, um, this is kind of their position. And you know, I did, I did find that if I disabled or if I tuned for PSNR, I got better PSNR scores. So there was a significant difference. It was very difficult to tell quality-wise whether it was actually better or not. But for the purposes of these tests, at the advice of the developer of XI265, we enabled PSNR. We, enabled, we tuned for PSNR for X.264 and X.265. Uh, main concept, we encoded with uh, encoder SDK version 1. Um, again, the command string and any files, which are the two files you use for, for encoding with main concept, were supplied by the company. We used their smart adaptive bitrate encoding technology, which is a, a high-speed encoding technology that lets you encode multiple files simultaneously. And this is important because we you know, again, we tried to match up the encoding time for X.265 uh, and main concept to, to, uh, to reach the quality level that uh, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the primary benefit of SABIT is you get a significant encoding time saving because you're encoding in parallel. They said you lost a little bit of quality. My test did not confirm that. So I saw no negative impact on quality by using SABIT as compared to encoding them individually. And then this is the encoding string that I used for X.264. Um, again, I tuned for PSNR. And I used two-pass encoding um, for all tests. And I used 110% constrained VBR for all tests. And that's kind of what I recommend to most of the people that I, that I work with on a consulting basis. Didn't want to use CBR. Didn't want to use 200% constrained VBR. And then Google. Um, I encoded with FFmpeg. Google didn't review these, but they reviewed the chapter on, um, on VP9 encoding in my book, and, and they approved that, and I used the recommendations from the book there. So I'm pretty sure they, you know, they think these are, are, are reasonable encoding parameters. So what I tried to do with, with uh, main concept and with XI265 is I tried to find, so, so with all these codecs, you have the ability to set a quality level. And the quality level impacts both encoding time and quality. So what I tried to do when I compared main concept in X.265 was find an encoding time that matched and use the quality level from that encoding time. Because you know, one way to look at it is let's, let's use the, the highest quality encoding setting. But if one is, takes two hours and one takes 10 minutes, then you need, you know, that's something you want to factor into your. So what I tried to do only with main concept and X.265 was find a reasonable time and then use the quality settings associated with that time. We'll, look, we'll see what that looks like in a second. I used SABIT for the encoding testing for main concept. And because X.265 doesn't encode in parallel very easily, I mean, you can, you can kind of simulate it. But I, I, I basically decided to use Capel Systems Cambria Encoder their X.265 encoder, because that's very efficient, does uh, parallel encoding. So for performance only, I, I encoded with Capel Systems Cambria encoder and SABIT. And then I, I again, I produced a, a quality level. Basically, it turned, you know, they encoded five files in various times from two minutes to like an hour and a half. And the time that I chose was around 11 minutes for those five files. So I chose the quality level, each encoder, used that delivered those five files at around 10 minutes, and that was level 18 for main concept, and a medium preset for X.265. And then for VP9, I used a setting of one, because that's the most commercially reasonable setting. We'll look at that in, in, in a couple of slides. And then for X.264, because it was very much slower, I'm sorry, very much uh, faster than any of these other codecs, I just used the, the very slow preset, which is a good preset, um, delivers pretty high quality. But again, it's going to be much faster than any of these. So what this kind of this is a chart that shows these are all the quality levels. So basically, what I did with Savit was I encoded 29 times, and I measured the encoding time, and then I measured the encoding quality with PSNR. And then this is this is a factor of the time, and this is the factor of the quality level as how it compares to a theoretical 100%. So with the main concept codec. Um, you reach the, the absolute best at 29, but encoding time, encoding time down here, which is where we were, was still pretty reasonable. But you see it really spikes upwards. And here, 
at the level that we encoded at, we were, according to PSNR, we were at 98.56% of quality. We didn't leave a lot of quality on the table as measured by PSNR using the, the quality setting of 18 for main concept. And then same analysis for X.265 preset. What we saw with X.265, and this is important later on, is that the maximum quality was achieved using the slow preset. And we used the medium preset because that was the setting that gave us the 10 minute encoding time that we, we match with, the, with main concept. So with the medium setting, we got 99.13% of overall quality, which maxed here. And you know, we saw this slide, we got 98.56% of the quality for main concept. Now for VP, I'm sorry, for VP9, we encoded with the setting of one because in my experience, that's the most commercially reasonable. That's what I would use if I was encoding with, with, with VP9 because it's, you know, you're getting a little bit more quality um, and the encoding time isn't that dramatically better. We tested with this in a later test I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, but you see the, the encoding time really spikes. Very few people use this because, you know, you're getting 0.35% additional quality, but you're, you're tripling your encoding time. And then the exciting thing for me is that we, um, we measured quality with a, you know, I do a lot of work with PSNR. A lot of people say PSNR is not an accurate measure of true subjective quality. So what we were able to do here through the, um, the work of a, a company who's at the show, Hybrick, was we used a, a quality measurement developed by Netflix. So this is how, how they use in their encoding workflow to to compare the quality of the videos that they're, that they're producing. So we replaced PSNR for one set of tests. This is an open source benchmark, and it's a meld of multiple benchmarks. So it's video multi-method. So there's six, I think, six different metrics that go into this calculation. And this was supplied to us by cloud encoding vendor Hybrick. And the workflow is I performed all the encodes. They did no encoding, although they have VP9, X.265. They could have performed the encodes, but you know, I wanted to do it in my lab. We uploaded our source and encoded files to S3, and then they ran the VMAP analysis only. So again, we encoded, they did the, uh, the VMAP analysis. And you know, quick plug for Hybrick, they're, you know, if you're using a cloud encoder, I think it's worth checking with them because they're a very affordable supplier. Their, their pricing model is you pay them 1000 bucks for 10 machines and the price goes up from there depending on how many machines you need to address. It's, you know, if you want to address 100 machines, it's a different price, 1,000 machines, it's a different price. And then you pay your machine cost. So there's a, there's a white paper that I produced for them a few months ago that compared their cost to a bunch of other cloud encoding vendors. If you're interested in, in having a look at that, um, there's the, the bit.ly URL. And again, for people who are writing all this stuff down, this is available, this presentation is available for download now on my website at streaminglearningcenter.com. Okay, so the issue here, <laughs> I don't use a lot of animations, but I get excited when I, when I but the, the issue here is, um, you know, do you, do you tune for PSNR testing when you're using the VMAF benchmark? So I asked Tom Vaughn, the, uh, Vice President and General Manager of MultiCoreWare, and he said, he said, don't use it. VMF isn't perfect, but it's the closest objective metric to subjective quality we've, we've got at this point. Um, so then what I did is I tested, I tested um, quality with VMAF without tuning and with tuning, and in every case, VMAF quality was not substantially higher, but higher enough. Meaning, you know, th these are differences that will change a rating, as you'll see in a few minutes. Meaning it'll, it'll bring it from, from second to third, or third to fourth, or first, you know. So, you know, th this kind of all came together over the weekend. So basically, you know, this is one of the issues that we have to, we have to look at going forward is, you know, what's the right thing to do? Do you, do you, do you tune or do you not tune? And I ended up tuning. So, because I felt it was, you know, I wanted to be as fair as possible to, um, to X.265 and multi-coreware. And, you know, I'll talk to Tom and maybe talk to Netflix and try and get their understanding of it. But, um, but that's, that's what I ended up doing. 
Okay, so here's, <laughs> jumping right to the data. Um, so we're going to look at a bunch of slides. Again, these are available online, so don't feel you need to take pictures or write everything down. But um, these are the 1080p com comparisons for the Meridian test clip. And here's the data, and here's the graph. And the color coding is pretty obvious. The, 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 re the, the worst scores are backgrounded in red, and the best scores are backgrounded in green. The overall winner is down here for average. And you know what we're seeing here is that according to VMAF, especially in the lower ranges, you can get a very significant, you can deliver the same quality at a very much lower data rate with any of those three codecs than you can with, with um, X.264. So, you know, a lot of people at this point are thinking about, you know, does it make sense for me to, for example, JW Player implemented the VP9 codec in their OVP last year. Why did they do that? They did that precisely because of this, because this allowed them to deliver m similar quality at a much lower data rate um, because they implemented uh, a UHD-based codec or a, U a codec that's focused on UHD. And what's interesting about VMAP, we'll look at some results with PSNR in a few minutes, and we didn't, we didn't, we didn't see this significant a difference down here. So up here, you know, data rate cures all ills. You know, if you want to throw 7.5 megabits at a, at a 1080p file, the quality is going to be good no matter what codec you use. But at lower bit rates, you're going to get substantial data rate savings using any one of the three codecs other than the, uh, the X.264 codec. And here's the results for Sintel. Um, Sintel is the, or I should say, uh, Meridian is a test clip that was produced by Netflix. It's kind of, it's almost like a fake movie. It's a, it's a, it's a period drama from Los Angeles in the 1930s. So it's a very movie-like video, all real-world video, no animation. Um, Sintel is, you know, all animation. This is by Blender organization. So it's, it's a pretty sophisticated animation. It's not a cartoon, but it, it is animation. And, you know, we're seeing similar results here. We're seeing, you know, this is the lowest quality. We see highest quality scattered throughout these three here. And, again, we see a substantial data rate savings potential um, at the lower end more so than the higher end. So here we're seeing this is the maximum delta, maximum difference between the lowest and the highest. So here, at 1 megabit per second for 1080p, we see a 16% delta. Here it's 4.43, and all the way down here it's very, and that's kind of reflective of what you're seeing up here. Big difference over there, small difference over here. And then the last clip that I tested with in this particular series of testing is Tears of Steel. And Tears of Steel is a, another Blender clip, and that's a mixed animation and real world video. Um, Kind of, if you haven't seen it, it's kind of like Transformer, you know. So you got uh, people turning into machines, and uh, but a lot of real-world uh, video as well. And again, we're seeing a huge difference here, and then that's getting a lot smaller here. This this uh, particular column is the difference between main concept and X.265, and we're we're less than half of a percent. And this is overall 1080p. And we're seeing, you know, a pretty tight grouping of VP9, X265 in main concept, and up here the higher data rates makes very little difference down here, you know, not to repeat myself. Very minor difference between main concept and X.265. And here's overall comparison, 720p. Again, this is the VMAP analysis. Big difference down here. Very small difference between main concept and X.265. Overall, a pretty minor difference between the highest and the lowest, but um, obviously some, some big differences at the lower data rates. And this is the 4K comparisons. Overall scores, again, for the same three files. X.264 is you know, way behind here, even at the higher data rates. Again, very little difference between the main concept and X.265. And big differences here, overall difference not so significant. And this is the overall overall. So I ran, 
you know, a bunch of different tests, 720p, 1080p, 4K, three different videos, five different data rates, and the difference between main concept and XI265 at the end of it, according to BMAP, was, you know, about, was, you know, about one-tenth of one percent. So what does this tell us? It tells us what I've mentioned a couple of times, um, particularly at lower bit rates, both of the HEBC codecs and VP9 deliver substantially better quality than H.264. So if you're looking for a reason to start implementing a UHD codec for 1080p or 720p videos, this is it, according to VMAP. Um, if you think that VP9 is much worse than HEBC, you know, my, my test didn't, didn't really bear that out. I mean, we've got, we've got 94.77 for VP9, 94.95 for X.265, and, and that's not a difference anybody would see. So we're seeing very little difference between those three codecs, and we're seeing, you know, pretty good reason to want to think about changing out of X.264 if your bandwidth costs are high. It should be a pretty, pretty easy way to reduce your bandwidth costs. And then if you're choosing between X.265 and the main concept codec, your analysis should be based on factors other than quality. I don't think, I don't think one delivers much, more better, much better quality than, than the other. So that's, you know, that's kind of where we started. And then enter AV1. And for those who haven't heard of AV1, the, um, there was a group formed in 2015 called the Alliance for Open Media. And that was formed by... Um, Google, Cisco, Mozilla, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, and Intel. What's kind of significant about the group is that Google was developing VP10, Cisco was developing an open source codec called Thor, and Mozilla was developing an open source codec called Dala. And what they decided to do was just, you know, combine their efforts, and rather than having three open source developments, they would combine their efforts to, um, to produce one. It's, 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 uh, why do we care about Amazon, Netflix being in there, and Google as well? Because major producers of content. And you know, if, if why do a lot of smart TVs today support VP9? Because YouTube produces in VP9 format. They want to support VP9 at 4K. Um, so I think this, these people, you know, I spoke with Netflix at NAB, and you know, they're basically saying as soon as as soon as AV1 codec is available, we're going to turn it on and start encoding it. And the browser vendors are all saying, as soon as the bitstream freezes, we're going to support it. So as soon as it's available, it's going to be used. Um, again, the first, what was exciting about Bitmovin's announcement was it came out of nowhere. You know, it, it, it really seemed like AV1 was being pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. And then all of a sudden, we got a press release that says, hey, we're showing it in NAB live encoding. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and let me say, it's, it's very early days of the codec. So, you know... Bitmovin spent a whole lot more time encoding these clips in their cloud environment with many, many cores than, than I produced with, you know, than I spent. So the encoding times here are going to be dramatically longer than what you saw for any of the test clips that we, that we looked at before. So that's, that's not really fair. They did meet our data rate requirements. They did meet our other basic parameters like op size and, and data rate control, but the encoding time was significantly longer. But I don't think that's a function of, I mean, I think largely that's a function of um, the state of the technology. It's just not, just not that optimized. I don't think it'll take 200 times longer to encode AV1 than HEBC and VP9, but I think it will take longer. Okay, another animation. Just keeping you guys awake here. Um, so the workflow for this series of tests was Bitmove and encoded the files. And they sent the files to me, so I could check data rate ad adherence. I could make sure they, they met the target data rate. Um, I decoded into a Y4M file, which is a, a YUV file with a smart header, and then I measured PSNR quality with the Moscow University VQMT tool. So VQMT is the video quality measurement tool. Why didn't I use VMAF? Because Hybrick didn't have an AV1 decoder, and the, uh, the YUV files were too big to upload to Hybrick in real time. Um, especially with my kids home from college, they were like, Dad, you got no internet. Um, <laughs> so so um, we didn't, I didn't use 
VMAP for this series of tests, I used, I used PSNR. And here's the parameters. The parameters are very um, VP9-like, but these are the parameters that, um, that Bitmovin used, and I have no idea what they mean at this point. You know, I, have, I, I haven't looked at this at all, didn't mess with this at all. This is, they've got this in production uh, for their customers. This is something they're currently selling. I don't think there's, there's not a lot of people who can use it because there's not a lot of AV1 decoding out there. But, you know, these are the parameters that they're using their encoding. So, again, I'm not saying this test is fair. I'm saying, you know, we ran this test and this is what it showed us. So what do we have here? We have PSNR comparisons for Meridian 4K. Meridian, again, is the, the Netflix test clip. Um, again, red is the worst, blue is the best, and Bitmove in AV1 is in the purple. So we're seeing, and remember I talked with VMAF, we talked about bit rate savings at the low end with the, with the VMAF benchmark. We're not seeing that with PSNR. And, and that's, that's kind of one of, the, one of the benefits, I think, of the VMAF metric, because I think it, it, it's more discriminating at this end in terms of quality. Um, anyway, we're seeing maximum delta about 1.56, not huge, but it is, it is consistent. And this is the Sintel clip, same thing, you know, purple is on the top edge most of the time, but the numbers are not huge. Um, and then again, for the, for the tears, of, tears of Steel clip, we see the same thing. So overall 4K comparisons. Um, I think this is a mistake. I just think I forgot to copy the, the programming thing that, that makes this turn green, but I'm pretty sure yeah, 4359 is higher than this. So overall, at 4K, um, Bitmove and AV1 was higher. 1080p, it was also higher overall, but not at all. Tested data rate strings. And 720p, it was overall higher, but not at the lower, at the lower data rates. So it looks like AV1 is going to perform better at 1080p and 4K than it's going to perform comparatively at 720p. But in all cases, the AV1 codec produced the, the best result. So, you know, you recall a whole bunch of slides ago, where these animations are kind of clumsy. Um, so we saw that when we encoded with the medium preset, which is what we used here, we only got 99.13% of the quality what would happen if we used the slow preset and compared that to AV1? We know the encoding time for AV1 was a lot higher, so I wanted to test and see, okay, let's, let's, let's make it as fair as we possibly can. I'm sorry about this. So what I did is I re-encoded X.265 using the slow preset, and that gave us the maximum quality that the codec um, could deliver. I substituted the new test clip for the, the Tears of Steel, and I tested it um, 1080p and measured with PSNR and MSSIM, um, which is a slightly better metric than PSNR, but still not as, uh, certainly not as good as, as VMAP. And what I found, so again, this is the absolute best X.265 could produce versus Bitmove and AV1, the videos that we saw before. Overall, in terms of PSNR, we actually see that, that X.265 won down here, and AV1 started pulling away at higher data rates. And then in terms of MS SSIM, we see a similar pattern, although they're very much closer all throughout the, um, the data rate cycle. So what's to say about AV1? Um, the bitstream is scheduled to be frozen by the end of 2017. Um, and that date looks a whole lot better now than it did, you know, two months ago before the, the Bitmovin announcement. Google, in a talk they gave at NAB, said that AV1 in their labs is 35% more efficient than VP9. Netflix said AV1 is 20% more efficient uh, than VP9. We're seeing less than that. Um, why would that be? 
Um, so if you get, there's a bit move in blog post, and basically what they say is the AB1 code base is, is based on VP9, VP10. And on top of that, there are 77 additional experimental coding tools available for compiling into the codec. And eight are enabled by default and enabled by Bitmovin in their encoding stack. And you know, Bitmovin's the only AV1 system in production. I think you'd expect them to be more conservative on their encoding. Every user, you know, Netflix is going to create their own, Google's going to create their own, Bitmovin's going to create their own, so that everybody's going to have a different version. We don't know how many coding tools were included by Netflix and Google. So the bottom line is, I don't see these results as inconsistent. You know, the, the bitstream's not frozen. We don't know exactly what's compiled into all the different versions. Um, but you know, I think, we're, I think we're seeing better quality today than HEVC and VP9. And I think you know, by the time the bitstream freezes and a number of these get included, in addition to the eight, I think the quality level should, should get closer to 35 to 40 range that Google is reporting, certainly the 20% range that, that Netflix is reporting. Okay, so there's, there have been other evaluations out there. The only other evaluation I've seen for HEVC and AV1 um, concluded that the H.265 reference software implementation provides a significant average bitrate savings of 38% compared to AV1 and 32.8% as compared to H.264. So basically they're saying that AV1 is less, delivers less quality than H.264. So that's a pretty, very different from what we saw. So what's different from our results? Number one, we use a commercially available HEVC encoder, not a reference encoder. So we use what people are using today to actually produce their clips as opposed to a reference encoder that takes so long that nobody's, gonna, nobody's ever going to use it. Theoretically, it delivers better quality, but it's unusable. Um, number two, we used a much more recent version of AV1 with more experiments compiled into the code. So the, that particular experimenter <laughs> didn't, didn't compile any experiments into the code. Um, number three, we used a, a version compiled by the company, not by the researcher. And we use, we use encoding parameters, and this is the most significant one. We use encoding parameters produced by the codec vendors, not by the researchers. And why, you know, again, I said this before, I don't want to create encoding parameters um, because the, the developers of the codec know it a whole lot better than I do. And so, you know, this researcher, and I'm not going to go into names, you know, he, he did everything himself without reaching out to the, the codec vendors, and I think that left his results non-representative. And again, the, probably most significantly, you know, he, he grabbed AV1 code from like a year ago. And you know, this code is, is up to date and a lot happens in, in a year uh, when a new codec is being developed. So what are the conclusions? My conclusions are, you know, if you're choosing between main concept and X.265, you're, you're not gonna make a distinction based on quality comparisons. You know, it's gonna be something else. Um, but the difference in quality, I think it was minimal particularly using the Netflix metric, which I think is a better distinguisher of, of real-world quality. Um, I think AV1 is at least as good as HEVC now and will likely be quite a lot better when the bitstream is frozen. Um, I think you will pay a price in terms of encoding quality, and we don't know what it looks like from a decode standpoint, but in terms of pure codec quality, I think it's, um, I think it's better now than HEVC and VP9. And you know, the more I work, you know, I, this is the first time I've ever worked with VMAP. It really wasn't accessible until Hybrick put it in their system. So it's the first time I used it, and um, and I was pretty impressed. It, it, it's you know, I like I like seeing the much lower scores at the lower data rates because I think that's that's an, a level of accuracy that um, neither PSNR or MS SSIM was able to deliver. But I think you know, I need to do some more work and, and understand the proper test settings for X.265 and X.264, specifically whether I want to tune or not tune for, um, for those tests. Any questions? So, uh, when you're saying 100% quality, what do you mean uh, in case of PSNR? Um, if you encode at the max, of the, the, you know, you saw what I did, right? You saw that I encoded at every quality setting. 
So one of those quality settings delivered the absolute highest quality, the highest PSNR score. So that's the theoretical highest quality. Does that make sense? So I don't want to do this again, but let me. So if I, um, so for, So for x.265, you produce the same file with every preset, every quality setting that's available. One of those is going to give you the highest score. So that's 100% quality. And then basically, this is just a percentage of that score. It's on a table somewhere. I don't know. I mean, I could I could show you, but it's pretty it's pretty small as you would guess, right? It's going to be. I mean, it's not a significant difference, but there's got to be a hundred percent, just like there's got to be a zero percent. So. But but it's it's not versus uncompressed. Hundred percent does not mean indistinguishable from uncompressed. Yes, it does not mean that. Okay. Basically, it means the highest. You know, again, when you in, you encoded a at a specific data rate target, you exercise, you know, you develop the, the core parameters, you know, the, the, the GOP settings, all that stuff that we saw in a previous slide. Then you measure the PSNR, and then theoretically one is the highest, and that's the 100 percent. And it's it's you use that to kind of understand again the quality difference between the other presets. Because really choosing an encoding parameter comes down to a function of, you know, it's a lot of things, but I mean, you know, the difference between here and here is not visible, but you're, you're cutting your encoding times by a factor of eight, you know, you're increasing your throughput by eight to turn it around. But, you know, so you want to know that, right? You want to know how much quality do I lose if I go from very slow to medium? And in this, you know, using these numbers, you don't, you don't really lose that much. But that long answer to a simple question. And uh, you said you were using hybrid for the BMAP analysis. Yes. Is that something they provided only for you specifically, or is that available to everyone? Um, it's for everybody. <laughs> we're friends, but we're not that close friends. Um, it, it's, not in their, it's not in their current product offering yet, but it will be. So it, it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's early days, but they. They had some customers who asked for it. They got it developed in for, I think, NAB, and I learned about it, and, and um, they were accommodating. Um, it's a lot longer. I don't know specifically because I ran PSNR on my workstation, and we ran, um, if you'd like, come up after the session, and we can, I can show you the logs, and, and you can see how long it took to. I have a 10, a 10, 10 core system, so we'd be limited to 10 cores, and it's pretty hyper. Like 10th order of magnitude? Or? I, I don't know. I didn't even look. Man, I, I was working so hard <laughs> to get this done. That was the last thing I. But, but I can, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll, I can, or if you want to look at it right now. Any other questions? Well, let me, go to, let me go to this gentleman in the back. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the, the VMAF uh, code that Netflix has up on GitHub. Is it, is it super difficult to compile it? Like, it like, do you think you'll eventually not have to use hybrid to do you're, it? You're kidding me, right? You're, <laughs> what do, well, I, know about, what do I know about compiling? I mean, hybrid, <laughs> does hybrid give it to you in a compiled version? No, no, no. Hybrid, hybrid is a, they're a, and Rob knows I'm not a programmer. He was trying to embarrass me in front of them. How was it? No. <laughs> The um, it it's a it's a it's a it's a cloud service. So it's it's they you know I uploaded the it's a JavaScript based system. I upload the files, and it just says compare this to this using JavaScript. I'm sorry, using VMAP, and then it does it. So you can talk talk to David um, Truscott. He's here, and I'm sure he'll tell you. But what's the word on the street? Like, is it, I, mean, I I really I. 
I, I would be totally guessing. I have no idea. Any other questions? I'm sorry, you? Um, uh, about the tuning for PSMR. Yes. If you are encoding H264 mezzanine files, according to one, one of your articles, I just remembered, mm. um, like going for H264 mezzanine files with 10, 20 amplitude or so, so pretty high quality, would you enable PSMR tuning for that, or would you disable? No, I'd never. I mean, the only time, I, the only time you're supposed to enable PSNR tuning is when you're testing for PSNR. Any other time you would, because theoretically, what they're saying is quality is improved subjectively when you don't tune it. But, but some of those, it, it's actually, you know, it's a pretty interesting topic. Basically, what they're saying is it looks better, but to subjective algorithms, it looks worse. And that makes sense. I mean, if you, and I don't want to go into it, but that's, yeah, the only time you use it is if you're, if you're testing for, P, if you're actually measuring PSNR, it's the only time you would tune, not for mezzanine files. Okay. Just for one last one, did you check the beam show an increase in quality when enabling PSNR tuning? Can beam effects both be protected? I know, and that, that's, that's the question I want to follow up on, because I really, I really, um, I need to think through that. It, it's a pretty intriguing question, but um, but I, I basically gave X.265 the benefit of the doubt and um, and and tuned because that delivered a better score. Did they uh, did they motivate the, like what, uh, why they consider uh, PSN tuning not increasing the subjective quality? I'm I'm sorry. Say it again. They base it on their experience with, I mean, it, they, they understand, I mean, it's intuitively there's some things that if you know how PSNR is measured, then intuitively there, and it, <laughs> intuitively means I can't find a, a good way to describe it, so I'll just say intuitively. Um, there are some things that, that, um, that could damage the score. Suppose you, you know, suppose you focus the quality on the visible area. And maybe, you, so you had really, really good quality here, but you had blurry on the outside, which is not what anybody looks at. So if you looked at the, the PSNR, the differences between, over the entire course of the frame, that might degrade PSNR score, but to a human viewer who's focusing on the heroin, it's, you know, it, it would be a better, it would be a subjectively better. So intuitively, there are things you can do that will improve subjective quality like attention weighting, that might decrease PSNR. So that's what they're saying, and that's believable, if if you know you know if you know what they're doing. I have lots of questions about the AV1 runtime. Do you have any way of comparing the runtimes to your machine? No, 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 not at all. And and it's even worse because they're they're a very very distributed encoding. So I don't even know how many cores they were using. Yeah, they were. They were doing live. You can you can read about the test. Anybody see that at NAB? They may. I think that they're. I think they're here at the show, and I think they're demonstrating that as well. But really, what they they fed a live stream into, you know, from OBS, uh, Open Broadcaster System Software, and they fed that into their. You know, I think they were using like 200 cores. Um, you know, and you can. <laughs> it's a lot of cores, but um, but the, it was live. Okay. Do you think it's possible that AV1 version that uh, Ben Egan was doing is equivalent to essentially the Bethan H265? And that might explain the disparity between your results. It really, it really could. You know, and that's why I'm saying it's totally unfair until we see, you know, until we see versions we can, we can test and play with and do. But, you know, I don't think people, you know, I don't think you choose between HEVC and VP9 based on encoding time. You know, I think it's almost irrelevant because, you know, you choose VP9 because it's available on all the browsers and HEVC isn't. 
And then once you make that decision, you choose the best possible encoding parameters for VP9. You, so, and that's why I use different encoding parameters in my tests here. For, for HEBC codecs, like to like, I think it's very relevant. So I think the same argument is going to hold true for AV1 because you're not going to use it in comparison to HEBC. You're going to use it because it delivers something HEBC can't. And that, so we don't have any way of knowing what the probability is that any number of those might end up in the frozen bitstream. You know? I, I think you know, that's, that's one of the processes they go through. Um, but I know that Google is very, I, would, I don't know what Google included, but I would find it very surprising if they included ones that weren't approved by legal in the compiled version they used to produce the 35% the, the better quality. No. no, I mean, that's not what, Google didn't do that. I, different discussion, and I need to close up. But I, all the points you're raising are, you know, are valid points. But um, we don't have any more time. So thank you for your time.